All right, welcome everyone. Thank you all for joining today. Um, I'm going to give a quick little intro and give folks some time to join before we get started with the AIA approved portion of today's webinar. Um, so my name is Bo. I am here with Ace Lab, and we are really excited to be uh, presenting this webinar with Atas International on designing with metal wall panels. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and just give a quick little intro about Ace Lab, uh, what we do, and show you how to find Atas on Ace Lab's website so that you can reach out to them directly after this webinar. Um, to follow up about any questions you might have about today's presentation. So Ace Lab provides free non-sponsored product research. Um, so our site and our tools are all completely free to use. You can head there anytime and get in touch with any number of manufacturers, including Atas. Here is a quick uh, snapshot of some of the members of our team. Um, so Ace Lab was started by architects for architects with the belief that we should spend less time uh, trying to research building products and find you know, the information that we need and more time designing better buildings. So we've been building a database of building products um, as well as search tools and project management tools to be able to save and store and organize your information all in one place. Um, so kind of getting away from this disjointed workflow of having to you know, find sticky notes, um, call reps, dig through all old project folders and really building one platform where you're able to access information and get in touch with manufacturers all in one place. All right, with that, I'll quickly head over to Ace Lab's live website and show you how to find TAS and get in touch with them after today's event. Um, so once you log into your Ace Lab portal, you get this handy dashboard of all of the work you've been doing, searches that you've done, products that you've saved, the conversations that you're having on the platform, as well as an overview of your projects. And we've got all of our searchable product categories up here. So that's a great way to find and discover building products. If you know exactly who you're looking for, you can always use the search bar right at the top start typing in the name of any manufacturer, that'll start to auto-populate, then you can head over to their page on Ace Lab. And then scrolling down, um, you can use this contact button to get in touch with them directly. So Ace Lab has a great messaging portal where you're able to you know, share project files, send attachments back and forth, and communicate about you know, all of the various information that you might need, um, and keep that in one place that's you know, in conjunction with your research as well as with your projects. Scrolling down, you're able to see an overview of the products. You can save those to your projects. Um, so it's a really great way to just kind of keep all of your research in one place and get in touch with reps when you need them. So I'd really encourage everyone after today's webinar to head on over to Ace Lab and get in touch with the task for any follow-up questions about today's event. All right. And with that, I've just got a few more housekeeping items. Um, so. First thing is I just want to mention that we did ask for AIA numbers upon registration. I'm also gonna send over a form in the chat. So if anybody's worried that they might not have included their AIA number, you can fill out that form. You can also put in a request for a certificate through that form as well. So stay tuned for that in the chat. I'll send it out in the beginning as well as at the end. Um, and then other than that, just wanna encourage folks to please submit questions to the Q&A throughout today's webinar. Um, we will save some time at the end to be able to get to as many questions as possible, and we will have a record of all of the questions that were asked. So if we don't get to your question, we'll be able to follow up with you after today's event. Um, all right, that takes care of all of my housekeeping items and the introduction. So I just want to thank everyone again so much for joining today, um, and I'm ready to hand it off to David. So David Weidel from Matas International is going to be presenting today's AIA-approved course on designing metal wall panels. All right, David, thank you so much for joining today and feel free to take it away. Thank you, Bo, appreciate the introduction. And ATAS is excited to be uh, part of the partners with ACE Lab. Uh, we are live online as of Friday afternoon. So uh, we're looking forward to a, a great relationship here. And I think it's something that's going to just continue to grow on and on. And with that, I'll try to keep everything going uh, in a timely fashion. And we'll we'll move along here with all of the the slides. Just a little background on ATAS. ATAS actually stands for Aluminum Trim and Shapes. We were founded in 1963. We're a family-owned business. Right now, we are in our third generation of the bus family, and uh, the fourth generation is is coming right along. Uh, the company started as a siding business. Uh, down in the basement of their Rochester homes. They would make trims for other contractors. And as that grew, uh, we now have four manufacturing locations across the country. 
Um, our headquarters is Allentown, Pennsylvania. We also have Mesa, Arizona, University Park, and um, an affiliate company, Bright Smith Coil Coaters, that can coil and post paint, coil coat and post paint all of our stock colors and custom colors. So we've been around for 60 years and we still have that family feel. We're large enough to handle about any of the large projects that are out there. And um, we're small enough. If you want to talk to the owner, you can pick up the phone and he's going to answer. Uh, it's something you don't find here with all the acquisitions and things that are going on. Um, we still have that family feel and we still promote on service. As far as me, I've been with ATAS for 22 years now. I've been around in the metal construction industry for over 35. Um, I've been doing this with architects and uh, contractors uh, basically my whole career, excuse me. <laughs> and uh, in my spare time, I handle the ATAS corporate partner program for national accounts. Um, what you'll find on ACE Labs is we do metal wall panels. Uh, we can also perforate metal. We do metal roofing systems, uh, curved and tapered panels, custom fab panels, column covers, insulated panels, interior soffits, perimeter edge systems, architectural accents, accessories, and secondary framing components. Uh, online, we have a spec builder. You can do online submittals. Uh, you can look at all the CAD details. Uh, you can find the BIM models. And one of the unique things we do is a photo gallery. So if you know a project um, panel profile that you like, you can click on that photo gallery and it'll show you like projects that have already been built and what it looks like in real life is in relationship to the building size. And with that, we're gonna start our program. <laughs> we're gonna do designing with metal wall panels today. And it is a AIA accredited program. Thank you for the water. And um, we will be handling the certificates. If you gave us your AIA program number, we will send that into AIA directly. Uh, this program has been approved for health, safety, and welfare, and it has also been approved IIBEC for one uh, continuing education unit. They haven't been approved in slideshow format. They do not approve everything that comes out of my mouth. I've been with ATAS for 22 years, so it's kind of hard for me to keep it generic and not say we or us. So I'm going to apologize for that up front. It is copyrighted, but if there are any slides or any information you'd like, we'd be happy to present it to you. So what we're gonna talk about is defining metal wall panel substrates, the different coatings. We're gonna talk about the basic requirements of a wall assembly. We're also gonna talk about the different types of metal wall panels and the different uh, joinery that's involved in different roll forming process. And finally, just understand some of the basic detailing and flashing components. And there's some nice jumping off points in this. We have uh, 10 programs right now um, that are AIA approved. Uh, a couple of them are um, interior design approved and a couple of them are GBCI approved as well. And they kind of go more into depth. So let's look at putting together a wall. So what we're looking at, you've got your framing system, whether it be masonry, steel stud, you've got your uh, exterior sheathing of one type or another. Uh, typically in standard construction that we're seeing right now, you've got your uh, weather resistant barrier, you've got continuous insulation, you've got some type of framing system out past that continuous insulation, and then your panel system. So if we look at some of the history, I mean, we're looking at things that have been around for quite a while. Leonardo da Vinci looked at the uh, drawings back in 1480 to kind of figure out how to form material between two cylindrical rollers and modify their thickness and their shape. 
Back in 1840, we had Henry Palmer in over in Britain. He was credited with the corrugated panel process. It was actually named CGI back then for corrugated wrought iron. And here in the United States in 1801, uh, Paul Revere started the first copper rolling mill in Canton, Massachusetts. One of his first orders was 7,600 pounds. You know, in World War II, we kind of created the need for mass production and we expanded those construction practices throughout um, the country. And now we're into the modern roll formers. And typically what you'll see on the modern roll form is multiple stand and each stand will take that material and move it just a little bit to form it into a panel profile. So the more stands, the less stress you're putting on that material. And that can help you in multiple applications, especially if you're looking at something that is has a wide flat surface area. And we'll talk about that later on in the presentation. Right now, the big buzzword in the industry is rain, rain screen cladding. Uh, it's been around for a while. It was We used to build things like this all the time. Back in the 50s, uh, we had that water diverter and we had a way to let that wall breathe. Um, if you're familiar with any of the building science that's going on right now, um, Dr. Joe has come up with the perfect wall assembly. And I put that in uh, parentheses, but it's been out there for quite a while now. And with the advent of the new ASHRAE codes that are coming and the new uh, IIBEC codes and the green codes, we're seeing more and more mandatory continuous insulation. And it's just right in metal's wheelhouse. We can do quite a lot with it. And the basics of the wall assembly, I mean, first and foremost, you, you need to control the moisture flow. If it does, if you're not controlling the rain penetration, um, it's not really a wall assembly. Then you need to look at vapor, whether it's coming from the outside with cold air going one way or another, or it's coming from the inside with high humidity going out. Um, you've got light, solar, other radiation, you've got noise and vibration, you've got fire. And, you know, we did the easy part first. When we transitioned into green assemblies, we con conditioned ourselves with our panel. And we talked our panel and our panel and our panel. And now that we're seeing, you know, when you squeeze that R panel, when you put those, that insulation in between some of your framing units, you're losing anywhere from 20 to 50% of that R value. So we've got the R panel part done. Now it's building that, let's take care of the vapor. Let's take care of the rain and penetration. Let's, let's move on and tackle some of the other ones. And we're just gonna show you a couple of pictures throughout the presentation of projects. Uh, if you see any that you need more information on, we'd be happy to help you with that. So with metal, you've got the base metals, you've got steel, which was initially used for function. It's been around for a long time. It has this high strength to weight ratio. You've got alu aluminum, which has that superior corrosion resistance. It's fantastic for coastal environments and acid rain areas. And you've got natural metals. You've got copper, you've got zinc, you've got stainless. And they've been exceptional, and they've been around forever and ever and ever. Um, it's a little higher priced. You're probably going to look at two to three times the cost to go to a natural material. But it's... Um, something it's it's been around it's been time proven and it, it has worked so let's take a look at um we'll look at steel we'll look at aluminum uh your copper and your zinc are pretty much formed the same way there's some installation that you need to pay attention to and we can get into that in another seminar but we're going to concentrate here um on steel and aluminum if you don't mind so you got two types of coatings on, on your base steel. You've got zinc, which is galvanized. And the reason zinc is used is because it has a fantastic sacrificial element. And also the new one is an aluminum zinc alloy, 
under the brand names. You've got Galvaloom, you got Zincaloom, you got Galvan. And it's a combination of both that sacrificial element and the barrier protection of aluminum in the base metal. So you can see in a hot dip process, what you're looking at will uncoil that base steel. We'll send it in, heat it up, dip it down into a liquid pot, bring it up and cool it, send it into passivization and recoil it. And it looks something like this in a nice, clean, new plant. Otherwise, it's pretty dusty, dirty. And you can see at the bottom the liquid coating that's going on, and you can see where it comes up through the air knives. Um, at the top, it's almost mirror reflective. So if you look about what happens with that mechanism of corrosion or that point of failure, what you're looking at with the zinc coating, if it's scratched down to the base metal, as the water washes over that zinc, you will get a self-healing uh, zinc oxide that will actually fill that in. So you'll get the gray area, but you won't get the red rust until all the zinc is gone. So from that standpoint, it's it was a great coating um, as long as it wasn't scratched and there was no zinc left. With Galvalume, they've incorporated that barrier element. And what we're seeing is you've got, you've always had corrosion at that cut edge. Um, and it's the term in the industry is edge creep. And what happens is as that water or that dew washes over that panel, any place there's that exposed edge, that zinc's going to keep trying to sacrifice itself. So you've got that opportunity for paint peeling or that edge creep to happen. So what has happened with the new alloys, um, it brings in a different dynamic. So what you'll have is the initial red rust, and but that red rust is pretty much limited to the thickness of the metal. So if you have a 24 gauge 024, that's going to be the depth of your initial red rust. With aluminum, it's a little bit different. Aluminum was always a precious metal. It's been around for quite a while. Back in Napoleon times, they used to give um, aluminum to the heads of state, and they would let the lesser people down the line eat off of silver and gold. Back in 1886, uh, Charles Hall and Paul Herlot basically develop an inexpensive way to do it. Uh, he received a patent in 1889. Uh, they still argue about who was first. Um, in 1959, as far as recycling go, Coors started a uh, two-piece aluminum pop-top lid and established that cash payment recycling offer on return pop-tops and cans. The nice thing is 65% of all aluminum produced is still in use. I mean, that is, that's fantastic. It's um, available on a wide variety of finishes and gauges. It can be recycled over and over and over without the loss of physical properties. And the recycling only takes 5% of the energy required to produce primary aluminum. As embodied carbon becomes more and more a target in the green movement, and rightfully so, you're gonna see your building operation is going to decrease their carbon output. So that initial layout of uh, your building construction process and your materials is gonna become higher and higher. Back when the green movement started, it was in the five to, um, 8% range. Now, after the, the teens and the now into the 20s, we're seeing it anywhere from uh, 12 to 18% where the embodied carbon is that much bigger hit on a project. The applications are very similar. Uh, you're going to see the difference. Um, mostly with your coatings, everything's going to be very close. But when you get into the high humidity and the salt spray resistance, 
that's where you're going to start to see the aluminum move higher and higher. Now, obviously, everything's got to be cleaned and pre-treated properly just to make it work. Um, and when we get into the paint issues, we're going to talk a little bit about that pre-treatment. And all the paint people will tell you, the warranties basically are the paint to the pre-treatment to the material. So the color is actually sticking to the pre-treatment, uh, not to the base material. Here's a project that's in uh, anodized in different shades and um, different width panels. That is actually a residence in New Jersey. So let's take a look at the different finishes that are out there. If we take a look, we're looking, we're going to look at coil coating for a second. Just real quick, uh, they're coated paint prior to forming. Uh, it's an advanced process. You've got inline cleaning, you got pre-treatment, you got primer, and you got color coat. It's a continuous process and it lets you have that high quality control that gives you that length of warranty. With the uh, PVDFs right now, if you're looking at 70% PVDF, you're looking at 30. They're talking about moving them up to 35, and I've I've seen 40 year on the market right now. And there's a couple reasons for that. And it's just performance. But a lot of people talk to us and ask us about custom colors. And I'm just going to get on a soapbox here for a minute and let you know this is what happens when you paint a coil. So we'll batch paint, we'll do multiple coils at a time. So you've got that coil coming in. If you start at the right-hand side and we're going right to left here, it'll go through the accumulator because it's a continuous process. It goes into the cleaning and pre-treatment section. It'll go up another accumulator into the prime coating goes through a heat oven, gets rinsed off. The passivization there happens, comes back downstairs, goes into the color coat or finish coating, into the curing oven. If you're doing laminating or embossing, that'll get added at the end, goes into the exit accumulator, and then rewinds. Typically, they're going to run between 200 and 350 feet a minute. So what you're looking at on that custom color charge you're looking at shutting this line down, cleaning out the paint bats, starting the line back up, cleaning out the paint bats, starting the line back up, going to painting multiple colors. That's where most of that is going to be added. There, you're going to see some differences, but you're going to add anywhere from 15 to 25,000 uh, when you get into some of the more complex three coat uh, color shift, uh, it could it can be up twenty five um, on your on your adder there. One of the things you should look at is you know when we were offering white and brown as a standard color, it was very easy um, to say we needed custom colors. Right now, most of your major manufacturers have 30, 35, 40 colors in their standard stock profile. So it's pretty easy to do what you need to do. Uh, the request we get most often is to match the window or door frames. And technically it should probably be the other way around because your window and door frames are getting post painted anyway. So if, if you can switch it to a standard color, you're gonna save your owner quite a lot of money there. Now, that being said, there are some brands that just have to have that color. And we can do that, and we do that day in and day out um, for those type applications. So if we look at pretreatment, we're looking at, uh, there's two types that are available right now. The original type, the traditional chromium conversion is considered wet chemistry. It allows a little tighter bend radius, uh, provides some enhanced corrosion resistant. And there is a dry in place coating where there's a new thin film added to the, to the coil before it goes through that process. 
So if you take a look, it could be aluminum, it could be steel, but just you've got your base metal, your substrate, you've got your complex chrome pretreatment. Above that, you've got a chrome rinse, your compatible primer, then your 70% PVDF on top of that. Uh, PVDF is just a fantastic product. It's been out there for 40 plus years. Uh, the first one was in Pittsburgh. The second one was in Saginaw. The reason they picked those locations was when you drove into Pittsburgh through the tunnel, there was this orange haze uh, over the city from the steel mills. And that environmental impact is what they wanted to look at um, what would happen to those resins in that PVDF formula. One of the nice things about it is it's related to Teflon. One of the bad things about it is it's related to Teflon. Uh, it's a fantastic finish. It is very slick in a wall panel application. It does very well. It's been out there 40 plus years. It offers the best chalk fade and gloss retention warranties in the industry. It's virtually maintenance free. It's non-staining. On a sidebar, if you're doing a roof, you should add snow guards to that roof. Because it's a one link off of Teflon, it is very slick. So when the snow and ice comes off the roof, it normally comes off all at once. And, you know, finishes are, they go by Murphy's Law. So if it's, uh, it's a, if it's a residence that that snow is going to let go when grandma comes in for Christmas dinner, if it's a business, it's going to let go when the owner pulls up in his brand new Lexus that he got on his year end bonus. And um, that liability we're seeing it come from the north into other areas into the Midwest. Um, and it's something that you should have in all your roofing drawings with standing seam. And I would make them make your contractor sign a change order if he wants to take it out to keep you your liability down there. So if we take a look at the cross section, you can see um, we've got that substrate. We've got that pretreatment. And typically it's going to be, you know, 0 0.2, 0 0.25 mils. Normally for your top coat, you're going to look at 0 0.7, 0 0.8. So you're looking at, you know, a nominal 0 0.9110 mil finish is what you're looking. But keep in mind that that one mil finish is probably... If I was doing this in person and we were having lunch, it's probably the wrapper your utensils came in is a good way to explain it. So, you know, the, there is a three coat system where they'll put another mill on top of that. Normally you'll see that with the high end finishes, uh, the bright, vibrant colors that are out there that um, would require that extra protection. AMA does a great job uh, with aluminum. Their reference on steel has um, passed and it is now uh, defunct. So if that's in your spec, we, uh, we should clean that up a little bit. But those designations are still out there. And you can see they, this pretty much mimics what we, what we showed on the earlier slide, where you've got the salt spray resistance, you've got the humidity resistance at 4,000 hours versus the 3,000 hours or the 1,500 hours, depending on which, which type of paint finish you're comparing it to. And the Metal Construction Association also did something very similar. And what this is, is just to clarify and protect people from some of the individual warranties that are out there. Some of them are uh, super duper lifetime uh, and why other people lower the, the quality of the paint, but sometimes offer longer warranties. Um, you know, warranties, no matter what they are, the fine print in big letters is gonna tell you everything that you wanna hear. On the back page in the fine print is gonna tell you everything that you just signed for. 
Uh, the industry is trying to clean up some of those warranty claims. So we've got a certified premium painted panel and a certified standard painted panel. And really what that means is the certified premium painted panel has to last 10 years on a South Florida fence. Uh, the standard painted lasts five years on the South Florida pen, fence, excuse me. And, and color control, and when you start getting into the fades, you can see these different Hunter units that are that are coming across, and if you look at them, and they're all the same color as they go through the color change in the lightness direction. Uh, it's a mathematical formula. It goes redder. It goes bluer. It goes lighter. It goes darker. It goes grayer. It goes cleaner. Um, if you're a physicist, we can certainly send that formula over to you, and your paint guy can help you out as well. So everybody uses this South Florida exposure test down in Homestead. Um, and it's um, you've got that effect of the UV, the moisture, and the heat. And it's in the southern tip of Florida. And it's excellent location for testing the durability of these painted materials. And just quickly, you can see what they do here. So if you go across the top, they will typically tape or cover the top portion and then you've got a an exposed that is unwashed and below that you got an exposed that is washed a couple of reasons we showed that is just to show you the difference number one and number two a couple of those warranties we were talking about earlier um, you have to wash your building to take your fade test and your chalk test. And uh, most owners are not gonna agree to letting you come out and power wash the building with soft scrub before you tell them that your their pink panel that started out red is uh, still in warranty. You can field paint um, and touch up paint systems on metal panels. Uh, they're, they're out there. Just be very careful what you're looking at and what you're trying to do. Uh, if you take a look at that roof panel uh, in the picture, uh, at that point, that panel should have probably been replaced. Uh, there's, there's just too much going on there, and, and it'll never look the same because you're never going to get that baked on look and, and finish. Uh, there are air drive systems on the market that are 70% PVDF. And um, that's probably the best thing to do, but uh, it will look different and, and sheen and thickness uh, across there. So we talked about those basics of the wall assemblies and, and how it goes in. You know, we've got that heat, we've got that moisture, we got that vapor. Uh, what are we gonna do to take care of it? So the first thing you need to take into consideration, what's the substrate? I mean, are we looking at plywood? Are we looking at exterior grade gyp? Are we looking at masonry? Uh, what's there? Then are we looking at a concealed fasten, exposed fasten panel? What about panel lengths? Um, I mean, we can put make panels 50, 60, 70 feet long. We've got a train track out back. Uh, we can send them out to your site. The guy's not going to want to put it up on a swing stage. And um, you need to keep that in mind. You know, just because we can doesn't mean it'll go up easy and should be done. We normally look at a panel length in 20, 25 foot range. What about color range? What are you trying to do there? Are, are you looking for a standard color? Are you looking to mimic um, some of the other materials that are out there? smoother embossed. Um, what about your orientation? How you run your panels is going to affect your subframing, uh, your installation direction. If you're looking at one of the tongue and groove type panels, where does that tongue and groove come into place? Is it start from the top and go down or does it start from the bottom and go up? 
Uh, all those things are going to affect the cost. Um, and we touched a little bit on continuous insulation. Um, it is increasing all the time. Um, 90.1 is the U.S. standard. And right now for all commercial and residential buildings, it's defined as insulation that is continuous across all structural members without thermal bridging. Uh, that's open to some interpretation. Some jurisdictions have taken it further than others, but it's, it's out there, it's here to stay. And I would expect it from everything that I'm hearing and seeing on, on new codes that are coming up and the next code cycles, it's gonna increase as well. So you got different insulation types. You, you need to know what it is. Is it uh, a rigid board? Is it spray foam? Is it um, something like a zip wall type system? Is it an insulated panel? Um, that's one of the newer applications that we're seeing right now. And then it comes to the weather resistant barrier. Um, that is something now we're talking vapor and we're talking air movement. Like I said earlier, we, we've taken care of the insulation, I think, very, very well. And now we're seeing the weather barriers come to the forefront because we've got the insulation, we've blocked the moisture from being driven inside the building. So now we've got that vapor that we have to talk about. So there are so many different types of vapor barriers out there. Uh, please, please contact and find that golden rep who knows vapor barrier for your location. Not only does it change by location, but it changes by building use. So what are you building? Are you building a manufacturing facility? Are you building an exercise facility? There are exterior and interior forces that you have to take into consideration. And we're finding out more about this in the building sciences. So as we're looking at that building envelope as a whole, um, this is becoming more and more important as it comes through. You know, we need to ensure that if any moisture gets into that wall assembly, it can get out. And that vapor doesn't condense and get trapped within the assembly. Because once that vapor gets trapped inside, you're looking at, What's gonna to happen to those steel studs as they sit in water? How long is that going to last? And how often are you gonna to have to do something in remediation? So in order of importance, and I can't stress this enough, you got the water and you got your moisture, you've got your air control because of, the air blows through it. There's no reason to have insulation if you don't have walls. You got your vapor control and then you've got your thermal control. So we've got those four areas of contention. Number two and number three are the ones that are being attacked right now. Um, those of you on the West Coast, uh, starting now on the East Coast as well, there is um, whole building air testing going on. And we're going to see more and more of that because that's being pushed by the Air Barrier Association and some of the other people and being adopted in the specifications for your buildings. And rightfully so. It's something that needs to be done, but it's, it's a team effort. There's no other way to put it. Um, if you got the right weather barrier and you got the right cladding system and you've got the right insulation system, uh, you're going to put up a great wall, you know, and the other thing you have to pay attention to is integration issues. What goes where, who goes what. The last thing you want is the, an issue on your project and have, you know, one person sitting there pointing at the other person, pointing at the other person. Um, everybody sat in job site meetings and had that happen. Um, we think it's something that needs to be coordinated and it's an important discipline that needs to be added to the construction meetings going in to the projects. 
So normally you've got a couple different type of wall assemblies. Uh, we're not going to talk a lot about pressure equalized here. Uh, we're going to talk about drain back ventilated. Um, if you look at a vented wall assembly, really what that means is typically you saw that perfect wall by Dr. Joe at the beginning of the presentation. So what you've got is a vent or a weep down at the base of the wall that lets any moisture that gets in drain out of the assembly. With a vented drain back ventilated system, you've got that opening at the top and the bottom. So you've got free airflow. Now you're moving it around a little bit further. So we've got continuous insulation. We've got a proper weather barrier. Now we have to attach our cladding. There's a couple of ways you can do it. And a lot of what we're seeing is some of the new engineered framing systems that are out on the market. Um, you know, we've got smart CI, we've got night wall, you've got CI girts. Uh, there's there's a bunch of them out there that can that can help you and not transfer any of that thermal load out from inside the building. Um, you know, you've got to put some type of thermal break in there. And as those codes get up deck updated, uh, that's going to become more and more and more. You know, the neat part about building science is we can see a lot of what is happening inside a wall without tearing the wall all the way apart, especially thermally right now. And what we're seeing is, you know, the old way of doing things where we would take in a residence and squeeze six inches of bad insulation in between a four inch stud, um, you don't have that R19 value anymore. And it's the same thing with rigid board. If you're setting your rigid board in a Z section, that Z becomes a, a thermal break that you're losing 20, 25% of your insulation. So that needs to be taken into account and you can do that through modeling. Um, you know, most of the time when you go through your comm check, you've got some type of modeling out there and some type of way to do it. But what we're doing is allowing that continuous airflow through there and it adds, to your insulation value, and it minimizes, excuse me, the effect of condensation. We've even come up with uh, clips that can be used, um, and they're stackable in different increments depending on how much airflow you want through there. So with wall panel options, you've got quite a lot. You've got exposed fasten, especially with the metal. You've got concealed fastened. You've got insulated metal panels. You've got metal composite materials. Now you've got metal plate systems making their way back into the market. You've got transpired solar collectors, which are actually the next generation of building cladding that helps with your building operation and maintenance. You've got perforated panels. You've got custom fabricated panels. Uh, we'll touch on them quickly as we go through and um, try to keep this thing on track. The um, exposed fasten provides that rugged urban industrial aesthetic. It's long lasting, it's been around for a long time. You've got a wide variety of panel profiles, um, but you have the exposed fasteners. And as you can see, you're adding exposed fasteners anywhere from 60 to 80% per 60 80 per square should i say excuse me you're putting a hole in that panel so that fastener becomes your major point that you need to look at it's a great panel because you get a great stretch out in your girth and your material usage is fantastic normally you get about 36 inch coverage all the way across and it, everything works very well. What we're seeing more and more is concealed fasten panel, where you've got mix and match capabilities. You've got aesthetic appearance. You can have ribs, you can have them flat, you can have it reveal, you can have um, a profile rib coming across. Uh, you can have horizontal joints, you can have vertical joints. And we just 
seeing more and more of that. And the tongue and groove, like we talked about earlier, as you see on this one, this one's you install from the top down, because as you're coming down, you do not want to turn that groove upside down and end up catching any water that's coming down the wall and sitting in that groove. With a positive engagement or continuous engagement all the way across, it's more of a hook latch pull type. And you can see that is put in and that starts from the bottom up. And that's where you start to get into more of your, your profiles. With insulated panels, um, we're seeing a tremendous growth in, in this, this market. Uh, one of the nice things about it is it gives you the ability to have your continuous insulation, your vapor barrier, your weather barrier, your R value, your exterior metal face. And if you don't like the look of the metal facer, what we're seeing is uh, barrier backup systems now uh, where they're putting other metal panels on top of it or even block or thin face brick uh, masonry to dress it up some so it doesn't look like a freezer. Um, metal composite panels, uh, they've been around for a long time. You've got, um, they give you that wide expanse, that flat area. Um, it has been, uh, there's been a tremendous growth in it, but now we're seeing metal kind of pull back a little bit as we see the plates come in. And a plate system is nothing more than a heavy gauge single skin panel. So with a, a plate panel, you're typically looking at 0.1. And with a single skin type panel, you're looking at 032 24 gauge with the plate panel, you're going to triple that thickness. So you've, you're going to drop that size, but it allows you to open up that profile and that flat area without worrying about any type of oil canning. With the transpired solar collectors, as I was talking about earlier, it's building integrated. It's something the sun heats that wall panel and we're using that to actually de-stratify the ceiling heat down into the airspace. And it, it just works. It's a very simple concept, very similar to the Trum, Trum wall designs that everybody was aware of, only they're sending the energy directly into the building, not to a storage space. And then how flat is flat? That's something that we need to talk about and early on in the, in the subject. You know, coils have a residual stress in them. So what happens, fabrication adds some stress to it, whether it's slitting or forming, and you've got substrate tolerances and misalignment of support systems and different types of substrates. So you got block walls, you got metal walls, you got metal substrates. You've got wood substrates, um, overdriving of fasteners using an impact gun, um, expansion and contraction, thermal cycling, what happens not only to the building itself, but what happens to the structure as it thermal cycles and uh, improper handling on site. The MCA has done a great job of um, assisting people, and there are some really nice reading materials on there that we can help you with but you can see in this on the picture on the left you can see the wave in the panel and afterwards you can see where a corrective action has been taken to push that wave out and push it out to the side so there's a couple things you can do to minimize that oil canning you can go to heavier gauge you know you're you're looking at a 25 the 20 percent increase per gauge increase. You can emboss the panel, especially if you're looking at a flat section. Um, you can go with a lighter color. And that's pretty much a no cost. You can go with a narrower seam panel, but now you're talking about putting up more panels. So you're going to add not only material costs, but you're going to add labor costs. And you need to talk about this early in the design and set that expectation. 
if you're taking a 24 gauge 032 panel, 16 inches wide, flat, and um, spanning it uh, over a concrete wall with wood subframing, um, it's going to look like a, a wave out on the ocean. It's it's just something that's there that needs to be discussed and needs to be talked about early on so that everybody understands what they're getting. There's uh, tech bulletins and white papers, and we'd be happy to supply those. The other thing is, are, is it precision level before it's being formed? So you've got some of that inherent tension in the panel. You've got edge wave, you've got camber. Uh, if you send it through a precision leveler before it's being formed, that takes some of that out. You can see on the left-hand side as it's going through, you can see that edge wave there. And as it comes out the other side, it's clean. Um, all that can help. And really the thing that increases that we see the most is substrate and uh, a wide flat area of the panel. Dark metallic finishes can also highlight that. Um, to minimize it, you wanna make sure your substrate is flat. There's additional stiffening ribs in there. You can go with a heavier gauge. You can go with a narrower seam. You can go with embossing. And there are uh, installation tolerances on uh, the MCA's website, and we have them on our website as well. Panel lengths we talked about, you need to think about not only how long can it be made, but how are you going to put it up? And then you've got panel joints that you have to look at. Is it going to be overlap? Is it going to be a splice plate? Is it going to be a divider trim? Uh, what are we going to do with extrusions? Are we going to use reveals? And the things that affect the cost, you're looking at, you know, aluminum versus a steel panel. Uh, it only costs a small percentage more. It's, you know, you're not looking at a total percentage of, say, 25 cents or 25 percent over the whole installed price. It's just on the material cost. And a lot of your better installers right now are saying that they can handle, because it's lighter, easier to form, they, they will install an aluminum panel less expensive than a steel panel. The number of penetrations, are there windows, are there doors? Um, do you have cut up sections all the way across? You know, how tall is your building? Uh, are we gonna have to do it off a swing stage? Can we do it from a lift? Can we do it from a ladder? Um, custom colors, uh, is it a custom paint finish? All these things are going to affect the cost of your product. But we can, we can end up with a really great looking job that you don't expect from a metal panel. It's just something that's been out there. So if nothing else that you take away from this presentation, take a look at this detail right here. The ones in red, it's construction by others. Uh, this guy going to make a killing if somebody would name their company that, because this is typically what we see that's being left out that is normally tried to be addressed at the end of the building. And the reason why it matters is if you don't get it right, um, this is uh, hurricane damage down in Florida, but if the hurricane wouldn't have taken off the cladding, you can see the mold build up on the inside of those walls. Um, and that's just an assembly issue. Uh, panel disengagement. This is something else. If, if you've got the right panel in the right application, if you've got an open air space, if you're coming through behind it. Uh, I don't know why I got that. Oh, we're done. Hmm? Okay. Something about voting. I came in. And... Um, if you've got a wood substrate, pay attention to what happens between floors. I'm finishing up here. We're, we've only got a couple more to go. Because what happens if when that wood shrinks as it goes down? 
corn conditions uh, can be done very well. It can be done with a bunch of pop rivets and J channel is too. Crimp curve, what you're gonna do on, do on your corners. Are you gonna take that profile around the outside? J boxes, Z boxes. How are you gonna do it? Is it gonna be a nice trim piece that goes up or is it gonna be a 10 foot piece of J and a bunch of caulk? Uh, nothing drives me nuts more than something like that. But you can do radius, custom profiles, perforated options. And those are all other presentations that we have. And with that, I just wanna say, thank you. Uh, wider panels are cost effective. Uh, aluminum adds about 10% to the material costs. Um, two coats, 70% PVDF. Pay attention to your specs. Uh, we, we can help you with that verbiage to help with quality control and it can give you that design that you're looking for. With that bow, I'm done. Awesome. I'm done. Wow. <laughs> that was amazing. Thank you so much. Um, super informative. Looks like we've got a few questions uh, okay. popping up in Q&A. So got a few minutes left. Um, just want to put a reminder for anyone else who might have a question, feel free to use that Q&A box. And if we don't get to it, we will have a record of it. So we can okay. follow up after. Um, all right, let's start with uh, Amanda asks, can you repeat the name of the wall assembly that you said is similar to the Trome wall? That is called a transpired solar collector. Okay, cool. Um, you can look up information on online or you can contact me and I'll be happy to send you information on it. Awesome. All right, great. And then it looks like we've got a few requests um, to see if you can share the presentation slides. Is that something you're willing to do? We'll yeah. also have a recording of the event that folks can watch too. Yeah, we'd be happy to do that. Great. So we've got a record of those requests. Okay. Awesome. This one looks like it's kind of a comment, but I'll read it out loud to share. Um, this person says, great information for metal panel selection. There's a lot of information to remember, such as the metal character of steel and aluminum, coating, finishing, installation, cleaning, MCA standards, barrier control, installation. And then can we get a copy of the PowerPoint? <laughs> yeah. So yes, it's quite a lot of information. I'm really uh, impressive that uh, you can remember it all. <laughs> well, you know, typically this is kind of a broad overview. And mm -hmm. Our other presentations, we have stepping off points. We, we will have a presentation on the transpired solar collector. We will have a tr presentation on demystifying rain screens. We will have a presentation on paint coatings and different assemblies and where we'll go into it in depth. Um, and, and we do more of that. This was just to kind of get everybody's mindset and some of the images to get the conversation start more than anything else. Yeah, definitely. Um, all right, let's see. Matthew asks, do you run into FM global issues when using insulated metal panels regarding the insulated sandwich material? Oh, geez. Um, I, I'll have to check, but I would, I would think there is um, FLM, FM testing done on that, but mm -hmm. I, can, I can verify that and get with him offline. Awesome. All right. looks like we've got time for one more. Um, from Remy, are there coatings that are self-cleaning and do not require washing? I'm sure there are, there may be some on the market, but that's like saying, is there a roof that does not require maintenance? And the answer to that is uh, unequivocally no. I, I you know, uh, a cold water rinse, a rain rinse on a on a PVDF um, paint finish is going to be fine. I'm, you know, there that finish you don't have to scrub uh, because it it'll release. Um, but should you rinse it off every now and then? Probably, I would. Um, you know, it's like cleaning out your gutters. No different. Um, if you've got a tree growing in your gutter, that's that's not a roof leak. That's a that's a maintenance issue. Right. Awesome. 
All right, well, I think we are right at time. So that is all the time for questions we'll have today. But again, we've got a record of all of them. So uh, okay. the class team can get with you offline if so. Um, so I thank you again. definitely follow up with everybody offline and uh, make sure they were answers, questions, their questions are answered. Should Perfect. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, David, for today's presentation. It was really great and informative. Um, and yeah, really appreciate the time. Um, okay. that just so. uh, for everybody, make sure that you add your AIA numbers. If you need a certificate, please let us know, and we'll be happy to get those uh, emailed out to you once we get the list back from Bo. Yes, definitely. And I just sent it one more time in the chat. Um, so if anybody hasn't done that yet, uh, feel free to go ahead and fill it out. You can both request a certificate and submit your AIA number there. Okay. All right. Awesome. Well, I hope everyone has a great rest of their Wednesday. Uh, thank you so much for having us in. No problem. All right. Bye. Bye.